It's in a very short version of in English. In, in English, we mostly pray for the our non-native non-native brothers and sisters, for they have it, or they are very much out of balance, and they need to return to our old ways to find love, harmony, peace, and spiritual awakening. So that we can all come together as one and not use all those gifts that have been given to us. Not only how to take care of each other, but most importantly, use the gifts that each and every one of us, every one of us have been given. And to use those gifts to ensure that no one will ever do anything to compromise or injure our, our Mother Earth. And let us, let, let us not forget how, we, how, we, how dependent we are to her. And hopefully on a regular daily basis we'll remind ourselves that if she is not healthy, how can we be healthy? And to, remind our, and to remind ourselves daily that we will use our cognitive mind to always work with the laws of nature and, and, and above all, try to forget what we have been taught. with all the science and technology that has been brought to us. And they try to tell us with this advancement of science and technology, they, they can, they have transformed our world into human creation. Like everything that is alive, physical and spiritual. 
no one can lay claim to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marshall, for that amazing welcome invocation. It certainly sets the appropriate environment for this forum. Good evening. I am Teresa Rajak Tali, and I'm Dalhousie's University's Vice Provost for Equity and Inclusion. I would like to acknowledge that Dalhousie University is situated in Shibuktuk, Halifax, the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation, who have been here for over 10,000 years. Also, though we are at the end of the month, I want to take this opportunity to recognize that October is Mi'kmaq History Month when we celebrate and educate ourselves on Mi'kmaq culture and heritage, including as we will hear tonight on the Peace and Friendship Treaty. The aim of our forum series, Speak Truth to Power, is to create the place and the space for analyses and discussions on critical issues facing our communities, communities on which our university was founded and remains embedded. Universities like ours are considered institutes of higher learning and Dalhousie certainly leads in this capacity. But we also understand, and just before this program started, Dr. Marshall gave me a, a lecture on this, but I want to acknowledge that we do understand that complex issues cannot be resolved with simple answers or from one dominant perspective. For this reason, this forum always creates a space at our table for our community knowledge keepers, a term that I recently learned from Catherine Martin and which I have adopted. I am deeply honored and humbled to be part of this forum where we will hear from Dalhousie's current and past scholars, as well as some indigenous community knowledge holders. Their traditional knowledge and life ways hold solutions for adaptation and resilience in meeting the physical, ecological, and social challenges of our times. We have much to learn from their timeless stewardship of the land and water based on respect, reciprocity, and reverence. It is with great optimism that I introduce this forum so we can all gain hope, wisdom, and resilience in resolving issues as a collective and with great humanity and humility. Before I pass on the virtual talk and stick to Catherine, who is our Director for Indigenous Community Engagement, who will be the co-host for this event, there are a few housekeeping notes that I must read. First of all, we will be inviting our guest speakers to join in accordance with the program. Everyone's camera and microphone have been turned off to ensure that our, only our guests are on screen. Unfortunately, there is no chat feature for this event, but please send your questions to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. The questions are being monitored and will be answered accordingly. This event will be recorded and used as an educational tool for future reference. And last but not least, this is a virtual event, so there are possibilities that we may experience technical difficulties. If this happens, we ask you to be patient and bear with us. So again, without further ado, um, I will pass the virtual talking stick on to Catherine Martin. Catherine? Yes, um just to get the evening started, I would like to show a couple videos and then I'll introduce our guests and talk a little bit before that. So if we could start with, um, there's a film that, a short film by UINR, Unamagi um, Natural Resources. And um, I wanted to uh, show you a couple of the beautiful videos that have been made about our community and just clips. And since Carrie Prosper is not able to make it today because he's out fishing, he's out um, catching eels and being filmed by APTN's um, um, a show for APTN. He, he's in the middle of cooking the eels and going out eeling anytime. So I thought I'd show you a little piece of um, a film that he was in called, called Seeking Netigalimp and his, um, it was done by Martha Steigman. But first I'm gonna start with Netigalimp 
UINR, just to get us started. Two I see into me is the guiding principle in our life. It is not meant for I, I as Amigamo, to live by one perspective or one consciousness. We are interdependent in every sense of the word. We have to take the best, what the white man has brought forth through his, through his education, through his different ways of seeing the world, and our ways. And to bring those two together, we all have to learn from each other. We welcome signs, but we also, ha we also have to depend on this uh, knowledge that has been evolving for thousands and thousands of years to our, to our language and to our belief systems. The Mi'kmaq word for sustainability, in my humble opinion, is encompassed in that word, Nedugulibk. To bring back the essence or the spirit of what Nedugulibk is, we first of all now have to provide an opportunity for the younger generations to be able to reconnect as to where our source of life comes from. And of course, this source of life comes from the forest. Our forest will bring us clean air, clean water, and it will provide us all the nourishments we need. You can take the gift that the Creator has given you without compromising the ecological integrity of the area in which this gift has been taken from. And to me, this is the essence. This is the essence of what that word implies, nedukulim. You are recognizing that the substance that you need also is physical and spiritual, just like I am. I am not the superior being. You cannot compromise the future generations of their abilities, not just to sustain themselves, but also to be able to appreciate and to maintain that connection to that source of life, which is our natural world. One day, my grandmother fish, Nugumi, called for me. Where is little fish? Where'd you go away? There you are, Gwis. I have been waiting for you. Nugumi, will I grow to be as big and strong as you? Well, in the beginning of time, the great spirit, Isul, created all things in nature equally. The sun creates life and gives us our shadows. The shadows reflect the spirits of our ancestors, Amsid Nogama. Nogami, what does this mean? It means we are all related. The people of this land realized that we were all of spirit, placed here on Mother Earth to help each other. Gluskap called upon us fish, Namij, to come to shore and give up our lives. He only took what was needed and gave thanks for our existence. We call that Nedugulink. Then what happened, Nugumi? For thousands of years, we continued to rely on our brothers and sisters of the woods and waters. The Mi'kmaq called us Bejo, the cod. They used small boats called canoes made of birch bark and small nets to catch us. They used us for food and to trade with others for things they did not have. They dried us in the sun and used salt from the sea to preserve us. The Ono, the people, were grateful for the help and honored us. Remember Nedugunak? They too only took what they needed. We lived in harmony with the people, the land, and all things. We filled the sea and we grew large and fat. Your great, great, great grandfather was the size of a dolphin. 
or a mud bed. But why have I never seen a cod so large? Well, about 500 years ago, people from faraway lands arrived. They came for us, amazed that they could not roll through the waters because of our crowds. They came with more and bigger boats and more and bigger nets. And they took us away without honor, without thanks. They caught too many of us. They took us before we could grow big and fat. They took us before we could have babies. They destroyed our homes. They did not learn how to live in harmony. They did not understand Nedugunink. What is to come of us now? That story is still to be told, Gwiz. For you to live strong, for you and your children to grow as large as your great-great-great-grandfather, Niskamich. For us to refill the sea, for, for that, that we, we must find, find a, way a way once again once. to live in harmony with our brothers and sisters. Msit Nogoma, all my relations. Nagespia Duxitkig. And that is the end of the story. Nedoglimp is at the heart of everything we do at UINR. Nedoglimp is the use of natural bounty. The support and well-being of you and your community. Nedoglimp means having community nutrition and economic well-being without jeopardizing the environment. As Mi'kmaq, we have the right to access and use our resources. And the responsibility yeah, to use them sustainably. We work so that future generations can enjoy the beauty and bounty that nourished our people emotionally and physically for thousands of years. Right on the top. Make sure okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for uh, signing in to our... When Marshall first came down and, and said we had a right, Elder Cougar, you know, I really uh, looked at it prayer, so. as great. Okay. Now the Mi'kmaq have a right, just like the federal yeah, government has a right to, uh, uh, I guess, regulate access to the resource. Now the Mi'kmaq have a right, treaty right to resources. And with that right comes the same kind of regulatory powers as the federal government has. And I thought that's what the right we carried and won so that we could, you know, implement our treaty rights the way we see fit and we could regulate it and, and we could manage our share of the fishing. I remain very optimistic that the Mi'kmaq Nation is undergoing a very wonderful process of revitalization. It's exploring the, the utility of concepts like Nduklamek to help manage and rebuild their nations. And the legacy of Marshall is, is just going to continue to grow and, and grow and grow. The Duke Link is, uh, is something I'm trying to understand or come to terms with myself. Because I have things I want and I, you know, use resources in a certain way. And I have to come to terms with how I use them, you know, and, and am I doing it in a sustainable way? Is it just for me? Is it for my kids? Or, or is it for things that I don't really need? And I'm hoping that, you know, when we get our act together and, and begin um, moving in a very strong economic way and if we do get broader access to resources that we we don't go down a path that was well traveled <laughs> and look at you know the economic and business models that are over exploiting resources and that we can do it in a more sustainable way with a a culture and spiritual connection to it and responsibility
Okay. Well, I think that, uh, you know, the spirits are moving us around and, and the little people, the Wulagamut are, are playing with my computer. So I apologize for our, our rough start, but uh, that's why I make films because um, as you can see, those films made by Martha, by um, uh, um, UINR and the COD that I made with the National Film Board and the Ocean School they speak for themselves. So that's why I like making films is I give those who have the knowledge, I, I give them the voice and hopefully I'm doing it in, in a respectful way. Um, so that was my piece. I filled in for Carrie. I wanted to show you a little bit about Carrie. He was cooking those eels. So I'd rather be with him right now, but here we are. We're not eating eels and um, um, Carrie's mom, she's passed now, Carrie and Chief um, Paul Prosper's mom, Annie, was the one of the best eel bakers in, in the world, her and a few other elders. So it just brought me back some memories and uh, I, I thank her for the, all the good stuff she shared. So I'd like to quickly say that um, I love the fact that we can share with you our community, some of them. And um, as you, if you're still looking for more information, there are there's many, many, many resources out there that are from our own um, voices, from our own communities to teach you. So I, I invite you to go and look them up and hopefully bring them into the curriculums. It's a pleasure now and an honor to introduce one of my good friends and somebody who has been a guiding force and still is in my life and many people's lives. Albert, Dr. Albert Marshalls from the Moose Clan of the Mi'kmaq Nation. He lives in the community of Eskusoni in Unamagi. Albert's a fluent speaker of the Mi'kmaq language, as you could tell a passionate advocate of cross-cultural understandings and healing in our human, of our human responsibilities to care for all creatures and our Earth Mother. The designated voice he is for the Mi'kmaq elders of Unamagi with respect to environmental issues. He's a spouse of the late Merdina Marshall, another fantastic friend of so many of us, and the father of six children, grandfather or great grandfather of many more. And as I said, a friend to thousands. In 2009, Albert became, um, along with Merdina, they were conferred the degree Doctor of Letters um, by Cape Breton University for their tireless efforts to promote our culture and language um, and work towards reconciliation with all of us and show us what that really is. They've de developed the Knowledge Education and Cultural Consultant Associates. <clears throat> they are strong advocates for the two-eyed seeing, a phrase that Albert, and I believe Merdina, coined for the gift of multiple perspectives. And they encourage us to use as a guiding principle for the co-learning journey. I'd like to um, Thank Albert for, uh, he is in such demand. I just feel like we, you know, we landed the rock star and he's agreed to be with us. So I'd like to um, just ask, ask Albert to um, think about what we're going to do. I, I was gonna introduce Carrie next, but he is fishing eels and you're gonna see him on APTN. Um, we also have a very special person who just every time I look, he's moving up the ladder. AFN Regional Chief Paul J. Prosper. Many of us know him as PJ, but as he's growing up into these big positions, we'll start with Paul J. He is now the Regional Chief, uh, I think it's a Vice Regional Chief for the Assembly of First Nations, representing the Mi'kmaq Chiefs of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. He was um, prior to this, he served as the chief of Buttigieg Mi'kmaq Nation from 2013 to 20. He's a proud graduate of the IBM initiative at the Schulich School of Law. 
Dalhousie University. Um, he has extensive experience in Aboriginal legal issues from a research, litigation, and negotiate, negotiation perspective. His work has been primarily devoted to advocating for the rights of Mi'kmaq people. Through the years, he's worked for several Mi'kmaq organizations, such as areas in oral history, Mi'kmaq land use, occupation studies, claims research, citizenship, consultation, first, governance, first Nations governance, justice, community development, nationhood. I've always been inspired and impressed by his presentation, so I wanted everyone else to learn and watch um, his beautiful way of teaching us about treaties and about the way to live, um, live those treaties through Netherlands. So I welcome and congratulate um, AFN Regional Chief PJ Paul Prosper. And of course, not finally, we know this, we have um, Sherry Picto, Dr. Sherry Picto from Ilsetuk, which means water cuts through high rocks. She's known, um, she's known all over the place. She was an assistant professor in faculties of law and management at Dell University right now. She uh, focusing on indigenous governance. She just came here from the Mount St. Vincent University. Um, she um, is a former chief of her community. And I do want to say that's a huge accomplishment because we have not had very many women chiefs in, in the new um, Indian Act um, election um, time. So I always congratulate her for that. And I always enjoyed meeting up with her as she was the chief. She's the former chair of the World Forum on Fisher Peoples, um, a member of Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Task Force on Indigenous and Local Knowledge. Her research interests include decolonizing treaty relations, social justice for Indigenous women, Indigenous women roles in food and life ways, and Indigenous governance. And we're very, as a Mi'kmaq nation, we are so proud of all three. And we really congratulate um, Dr. Sherry Picto for her accomplishments and for receiving her, um, her doctorate. Now, without further ado, um, I'm going to ask our elder Albert Marshall to please begin with our conversation about living the treaties, the peace and friendship treaties through Netagulim. Yeah, I'd like to extend my appreciation for allowing me to be part of this wonderful conversation. I believe we have a lot of work ahead of us in which we will acknowledge and accept knowledge no matter where they come from to give us a helping hand to so ensuring that as we move forward, it's not going to be business as usual. But rather we're going to do some reflection and seriously look at where we came from and how we got here. And some of the injustices, whether environmentally, or social or otherwise. And to, and to use this time now to really look at, look at <clears throat> not, just, not, not just what we have done, but the harm that we have created. And to spend some time to extract the lessons that we need to learn if we're going to be moving forward together in a health and balanced way. And for us, it's been very, <clears throat> it's been very much simpler. We have, we had concepts and words that constantly guide us as to how we, we individually or collectively conduct ourselves. What are, 
responsibilities are and always be there to remind others when they, whenever they fail to exercise and to live up to their the inherent responsibilities. So the word nedukulim to me is a very, it's a very, um, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a concept that not only um, reminds us that we have a privilege of harvesting the resources from our Creator, from our, our Mother Earth, but most importantly, to constantly fine tune our actions so that not, not, not individually or collectively, nobody will ever compromise the integrity of the area. And I believe um, this concept not only has helped people from many, many generations in the past and even to the present of exactly what our inherent responsibilities are. And to us are very, very clear. We cannot manage Mother Earth. But we mm -hmm. have to manage ourselves. So we have we have been given this responsibility to be responsible to the geographical area in which we were, we were placed. And that responsibility extends beyond the laws of man or the laws of, or, or the needs of man, but rather the laws of nature and, 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 and the needs of nature. So when it, whenever anyone wants to come and live among us. It had to be a, a long negotiation in which that person would be taken to a special place, whether it's in a TPO or in a special designated place, to be informed that if they choose to live among us, these are the conditions in which he or she has to accept. That no action that no action that they it will ever take, that they will ever take, will ever compromise the integrity of the ecological integrity of the area. And also take upon that same responsibility as we had. Whenever they see someone else not exercising and living up to those responsibilities, that they that they, that they are responsible to set that person straight, to remind that person to go back to the original or original agreement. And if, and, and if there is some indication this person then does not want to comply with those conditions, then I, un then I understand and I believe it will have no other alternative for the community, for the, for the, for the members within that, within, that, within that geographical area. To force that person to move on to somewhere else, because the efforts or the works that are going to be required of maintaining the integrity of that area, it's going to require everybody that's living within that within that uh, geographical area, because as you as you are living for a long period of time within that geographical area, you, you then become intimately knowledgeable and connected to the land. 
Because without that in, in depth understanding of how nature works, how migrations take place and happen, uh, how seasons are, are different, then I think it'd be, very, it'd be rather difficult for anyone to try to abide by the conditions that were set forth by the, by the community at large. So medical to me then is one of, one of the key guiding principles of not just how, how we're going to live, live how, we, how, how one is going to live in a certain geographical area, but also to, to live by the responsibilities that that person has of ensuring that none of, the, none, of the, none of his or her actions will ever be seen or taken to compromise the ecological integrity of the area. Because this commitment, as we say, extends to seven generations. We realize from human scale, seven generations is a long period of time. From human scale, it's a long period of time. But when what we do know, when we compare that with nature, it's only a blink of an eye. So even though the efforts have to be have to be agreed upon for the next for the next seven generations as to what the, what those responsibilities are and how and, and uh, those respond how to how to manage ourselves and manage other other people that may come into our area, then we would we, we, we would then be concerned because if 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 those actions are not collective, if those actions are not committed by every individual, then there's a chance that that geographical area will not and can't and can't sustain that many people for any for any period of time. So in our in our understanding, the only time we use rights is we have a right to, to ensure that no two-legged will ever do anything that might compromise the integrity of the area and in turn will compromise the wellness to all our, to all our relations because the overall objective always has been we will use our collective effort. We will use our collective knowledges and, 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 and skills and tools we have of ensuring that our Mother Earth is and will always be healthy. Because how far do you have to imagine how, in, how dependent we are to her, that we need every, every aspect of our existence depends upon her being healthy, clean air, clean drinking water, fertile soil, and, 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 all, and the rest of our gogomana, our, our relatives, we depend on them for substances as well. So, that word then is, in my humble opinion, encompasses traditional knowledge. And of course, traditional knowledge, every culture has traditional knowledge. But in, our, in, in this particular case here, we're talking about a Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge. A traditional knowledge has been evolving here for thousands and thousands of years to observing, to, to being part, being, being, being uh, connected with, with, this, with this area in which we use that knowledge to help mother nature to, to be healthy because if she is healthy we too will be healthy. So I believe um, that word Nedukulim 
I believe, has to be put into a much um, special place rather than just say, I have a right to sustain myself. That's only a very small part of that. The biggest part of that word, of course, is our inherent responsibility as to how we, not only how we conduct ourselves individually, but also be instrumental of helping others to conduct themselves in a balanced and harmonious way with our Earth Mother. So I believe um, as we are entering into this era in which we hear over and over again rights, yes, we have rights to our treaty and Aboriginal rights. We have rights as human beings. But I believe as well we should be we should be emphasizing more and more of what those what, what, what every right bears a greater greater amount of responsibility. And I believe this is why I believe or maybe this is one of many reasons why we are here tonight. It's because someone is only looking at the human right or Aboriginal right. So and 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 uh, and and they expect us, expect the Mi'kmaq people to to at least demonstrate that they are responsible, because we 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 will we will not we are not there and we will never be there as long as this dominant system is refusing to acknowledge, even though they are saying it, they, they, are, they are on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. How, 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 how they have forgotten that they don't have, they don't have any special relationship to the land like we have. And that special relationship has been vested in the court and in the treaties. And we're the only group of people in this hemisphere that have a special relationship to the land with two treaty and Aboriginal rights. But for some reason, each and every time when an issue comes up, those interpretations are constantly reinterpreted to appease someone else, the government and the oppressors. I mean, for, I mean, even even my limited understanding with English. How can you possibly define? How can how can anyone else really define what modern livelihood, other than us? They have a prerogative to define it how they see. But I think they're, they're, in a, they're, they're in a complete different situation. They don't have that special relationship to the land, to any rights, other than privileges. So what is the problem? I believe the problem is that I think we have to convene the authorities, institutions as well, and really redefine what, who is part of this humanity? Are Mi'kmaq people part of, part of this human race? Are Mi'kmaq people fall within the, within the realm of human rights? And do the do, uh, average or Mi'kmaq people fall within the realm of, of so called, their, their so called interpretation of justice? 
apparently not, because what is happening down down South Shore is not about uh, like modern livelihood. It's all about the police are not compelled to uphold the law. And 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 the and, and the issue escalated to a point where through their through their inactions, it's legitimizing the people that want to take that control to take whatever actions they, they can take. So if that that would not have escalated if the RCMP were were forced to uphold the law. And anyone that break that's a lawbreaker would have been would have been held accountable. But apparently that's not how it works. So I believe now it's the onus is probably up to us to, to make those clear definitions for us. Because yeah, apparently they're not going to give us that, that opportunity. We're all always going to be outside of, outside of the box. And, and um, even though we're trying to do everything in a peaceful in a peaceful way, we're still constantly praying on a daily basis that love, love will prevail. And that's the only hope that we are really hang, hang, holding on to because this is just one of many, many, many genocides that not only this generation is facing, but for many generations in the past. And you know what? We're still here. And I believe now with with the blessing of a lot of our, a lot of our non-native brothers to become an ally, I believe we stand a better chance this time around of gaining a little more ground to be able to exercise our responsibilities as to how we how we utilize the gifts of the creed. How we look upon our Mother Earth. How we look upon every living thing as our certain Ogoma, all our relations. Mm. Thank you. Oh, Walalin, Walalin. Oh, we could listen to you all night and you know that. Um, so many things that you said are obviously going to, uh, obviously, uh, Sherry and um, PJ have lots to follow up with. I, I just want to mention that um, as you were talking about this, Albert, <clears throat> I know that you've lived this. You lived the oppression. You lived um, the laws. You know, even though we had the laws to hunt, fish, and gather, you lived that time when you were not allowed. And um, so you bring us so much knowledge and, and it's time that people listen to the story. When I, um, I, I met PJ when he was very young <laughs> and I've watched him um, always be such a respectful um, human being. And I remember uh, when the Marshall decision, the first Marshall decision came down and we were all in Halifax and I walked in on this amazing group of people trying to find out when, what is that um, decision? Is it true? They were waiting for it to come down so they could read it because they heard that we won. And I know PJ was there and I remember that. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and um, know that you took that, you took that decision and you've worked so hard to make it, uh, make it live. So I'd like to ask you now to just follow in the conversation. Okay, and uh, thank you, Will Allen, Kathy, and Will Allen, Albert. Um, 
Hmm. It's always quite an experience to um, follow the words of um, a respected elder like Albert Marshall. And um, I, I just thought I would, you know, provide a certain, um, some comments on, uh, from a personal perspective on sort of uh, a journey I've taken, uh, as mentioned earlier by uh, Kathy. Um, I, along with many others, were there present when the uh, Supreme Court of Canada released um, the Marshall decision back, you know, in 1999. But I even want to go farther back than that to um, share a story from our community, the community of Bakunke, which you know, uh, means, uh, some say Bakunga means by the bay and and certainly we're, we're, we're connected like most communities to the lands and resources. And, you know, our community has certain um, parallels with um, Bear River as well. And Dr. Sherry Picto is, um, we've had many discussions, you know, on a, a number of issues and, so exciting that we have this opportunity to just sort of maybe provide some insights on uh, how things have transpired. Where I want to begin is I, I want to begin, you know, uh, to a time, you know, prior to 1999, you know, back in 93 when Donald Marshall Jr. was uh, fishing eels in a place not far from our community. Actually, it's our reserve lands are, exist in a place called Bonneg, meaning the cove uh, in English. And just off of Bonneg is where Donald Marshall uh, was fishing eels. And, you know, it, it, it was something uh, at the time my brother, uh, Kerry Prosper was chief. Uh, and who is fishing eels right now or cooking eels and uh, as a family eels played a major role in terms of sustaining us you know um, I, I come from a family of 14 and uh, we were all raised by a, a single mother and you know uh, my father died when I was two so um, food was something that you know we all really need it. Uh, I would say about 60% of our food was uh, either from the water or from the land. And so, you know, when, when that, you know, uh, decision came down uh, in 99, we, we were all um, sort of um, taken by that. Um, there was an opportunity, a recognition of a treaty right. Uh, in this instance, uh, the treaties of 1760 and 61, and uh, you know the range in which a decision can be uh, provided can be quite narrow or it can be quite broad. And in this instance, because uh, we're talking uh, one treaty that has been ratified over two years, uh, 1760 and 61, what that essentially did was it, it had wide application beyond the waters of uh, Punkett for sure. And, you know, throughout a Mi'kmaq as well, um, several provinces and, and it not only involved eel, not only involved fish, but it was hunting, fishing and gathering activities to uh, gain a moderate livelihood and as uh, Dr. and respected El uh, Elder Albert Marshall mentioned, you know, the subject of moderate livelihood is quite uh, at the forefront now. And, you know, when, when you think about these kinds of situations, um, uh, and as Albert has mentioned, um, through uh, the definition of nedegolunk, uh, there's a, a basic principle that is shared with um, within Mi'kma'ki and, and as Albert has mentioned is with rights come uh, responsibilities, you know, and it's actually the responsibility that underpins the right. And 
I heard my brother say, you know, treaties are, are here for the animals, you know, they're here for the resources and it's reflective of that role of Nedigalum that we protect the lands and resources and we, we take what is needed. And um, through the course of what has, had ensued after the um, Marshall decision, um, we all know what happened in Burn Church um, with DFO and community members uh, looking to uh, practice their rights. Um, there were some agreements that were entered into uh, basically with most uh, Mi'kmaq Maliseet communities. Uh, 34 of the 34 communities that signed um, Marshall agreements, these are agreements to uh, provide access. Um, at the time, Herb Dollywall, um, Minister of uh, Fisheries and Oceans, uh, and the federal government came with a two-fold mandate. One was through DFO to um, provide access, a short-term sort of uh, mandate. And then there was a longer-term mandate to, uh, that was given to Indian Affairs um, to uh, negotiate the actual right. And so um, those agreements that were entered into at the time, uh, they approached um, uh, each community individually, band by band, and um, they were largely without prejudice agreements and um, to the rights that, that the Mi'kmaq and Malisi peoples had, and it provided a baseline level of access. However, uh, you know, we have never really got to the point of um, negotiating or discussing the full right. Um, so you have um, most bands who, you know, signed on to those agreements, uh, at least 32 of them of the 34 and um, the remaining two that didn't sign a Marshall Agreement uh, were Bakunke and Bear River. And the reason for that was um, at least for Bakunga, and I'm sure uh, for similar reasons with Bear River, and I'll leave that to Dr. Sherry uh, Picto, was uh, the community was waiting for an actual full mandate, a full right, you know, to be discussed uh, between uh, government and ourselves. And uh, frankly, to this day, uh, that was never offered. The, the unique feature here is, um, you know, we're, we're talking about a treaty right uh, that has been recognized and, and affirmed within uh, section 35 of the constitution. Um, it's important to note that the right has always existed previous to its recognition within Canadian law, but once recognized through the constitution, it, it essentially becomes constitutional law. And um, so, you know, the question becomes, well, it, it's a constitutional law. It, it's been affirmed and recognized by the highest court in this country. So it's a law within Canada and, you know, the whole constitution and uh, the constitutional framework of Canada operates by the principle of the rule of law. So nobody's above the law. And um, the law of the land is essentially that, the law of the land. And um, so it was a rude awakening for me to realize that it's not good enough to have a constitutional right recognized by the highest court in this country that doesn't really mandate or force a government to actually implement the right. How government attempts to, attempts to implement rights uh, is usually through the process of negotiations. And uh, an integral com component to that is them getting a mandate from cabinet. And so for Bakunga and Bear River and for many many uh, of First Nations here in Mi'kma'ki, 
we've waited for 21 years to get that mandate. Uh, essentially, there is nothing really uh, to force government to respect the laws within this country. It, it sort of gives a mechanism of picking and choosing which laws uh, they're going to enforce. And uh, it's been the subject of certainly recent activities you know, um, certainly in St. Mary's Bay and uh, St. Peter's Bay, and it will be in other parts uh, of, you know, throughout Mi'kma'ki. You know, and, you know, it, it's, it's something to work through. I mean, um, the realities of what is going on and because it's been a long time and, you know, you hear certain things like uh, reconciliation being discussed, uh, and there's a distinct need for um, a, reconcili a reconciliation to exist between Mi'kmaq treaty law and, you know, in this instance, uh, the Fisheries Act, um, federal law, and those have to come together and be reconciled. There's a distinct need uh, for that reconciliation to emerge and to exist. And um, it's largely uh, upon the federal government to create that environment for true reconciliation to, to exist. Uh, their approach as of recently, um, you know, in 2017 was to uh, try to get communities to sign these, what they term to be rights reconciliation agreements, which essentially um, provides money to the band to uh, purchase access from um, non-native fishers. Uh, in exchange, um, you know, they would practice that right and uh, and they would once they get that access, they would do so in accordance to um, DFL rules and regulations. And, uh, and by the way, what they would have to do as well is to suspend their treaty right for 10 years. So it was more or less a mechanism to uh, get, you know, uh, our First Nations to suspend the actual application of our treaty rights. You know, we've been waiting for a very long time to practice Nedekulam. You know, uh, as Albert has mentioned, you know, we have that responsibility. It's something that has been um, embedded within, you know, our nation. It's something that we have waited for a very long time to bring forward and to practice and you know this is a really interesting time you know um imagine you know picture chiefs you know at a negotiating table and uh when they go back to their communities you know somebody says so can i go fishing can i you know actually practice this right to foot food on the table, to clothe my children, to put some gas in the car. And picture that chief, you know, that leader or that counselor of the community saying, no, not yet, after 21 years. It's basically an approach of negotiation without recognition. And it just doesn't cut it anymore. You know, there is a new paradigm that is desperately needed, you know, to emerge uh, from, uh, you know, government. And now is the time, the world is watching what happens next. You know, uh, often, in order to get recognition, I'm not sure how much time I have, Kathy. Oh, about a minute or so. Okay. 
I'll oh, wrap it you. up. Usually, in order to create an Aboriginal law, you have to break a law that is unjust in the first instance. And how that usually takes place is through uh, direct action. You, you get somebody that just says, uh, I'm fed up, you know, I'm going to do something. And, you know, and once that happens, uh, they're typically charged and litigation ensues. And so we've been to court, we got decisions, you know, and now we're in the stage of negotiation and we need an actual mandate that represents the right. If that doesn't happen, this, the whole ne negotiation process will end and we will go back to court and there'll be more direct action taking place which is sad. I mean, like, what other options do we have? Do we go to court again to force government to prove, uh, to recognize a right that was already proven, you know, uh, through the highest court in this country, recognizing the highest law in this country? So th there's desperately a need for movement something that reflects the true nature and intent of our treaty relationship. So we'll all leave, Owen, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I love this conversation because we're actually not a three second or a 30 second clip on the news. We're actually trying to help everybody in Sutton understand. Sher Dr. Sherry Picto, Chief Sherry Picto, um, I'm going to just let you roll with this part. Not quite a lawyer yet, but I am in law, which is weird to me. But uh, yeah, I was uh, telling uh, another group of students today, you know, uh, I welcome the day I can tell a story without having to talk about law, but we all have to talk about those court cases and so forth. I'm going to take a little different slant here, but first I want to acknowledge uh, um, Elder Albert. You've really kept me grounded in the last few weeks and Kathy and, and it's so great to have our regional chief or new regional chief here um, really kept me grounded. And um, maybe I'm getting old too, uh, because I've had a lot of PTSD with this second round. Uh, Bear River was there on the forefront, uh, the first round. And um, I can remember hauling our few fishers off the water because of the violence that was starting to ensue then. Um, I want to acknowledge my grandmother. She was a chief in the mid 1970s. And I remember the first time I even met um, Chief Reg. He was such a young man at that point, And I was just a little girl at that point. But um, I traveled around with her quite extensively and um, uh, came to know Donald Marshall Sr. more so than Donald Marshall Jr. I think I was in my early 20s when Donald Marshall Jr. was finally released from prison for the crime he didn't commit. And I think it's really important to honor Donald Marshall Jr. For, and I caught myself throughout the years saying uh, the Marshall case, the Marshall case. And it's just really important to um, highlight him, to honor him, because with his first deal with the law where he was um, convicted for a murder he didn't commit, out of that came the big inquiry and we're still trying to, the Marshall inquiry, we're still trying to implement all of that. And then of course, he sacrificed the next few years, uh, you know, winning this right to uphold, you know, our treaty right to, to a livelihood to sell. And so I really want to honor him and his family and all of those that uh, went before us, Chief Nul Doucet, uh, Captain Alex Denny, I remember that day when um, my daughter was nine months old and I was carrying her on my back into the World Trade Center when we had won. Donald Marshall Jr. was the first to greet me. 
Then there was Joe B. Marshall. He looked at my little girl and said, you know, this is a good day for you. And then I found Alec Denny, Captain Alec Denny, and he was sitting on the floor exhausted with tears in his eyes. And he said, I knew, I knew we had a treaty right. And there's quite an extraordinary story uh, with um, Alec Denny in terms of how many times that he got laughed and at and so forth because he knew these treaties. And of course he would have known the time of Grand Chief Silloboy and so forth. And so I'm so grateful that my grandmother took me on the road, those rugged roads back then. And this is when we had just the um, Union of Nova Scotia Indians and she instilled in my mind, you know, united we stand, divided we fall. And she instilled that into me from a little girl. And uh, it's been uh, difficult to hold that line. But what I wanted to talk about, you know, these negotiations that were going on, uh, it became very clear to me because Bear River didn't sign a food fishery agreement. We never signed a commercial fishery agreement. And just somehow inherently we knew. So we never received any of the big bucks. We never received any boats or anything like that. And uh, so we've been just struggling along. And um, so I started wondering, you know, what do my people, after we've been through all of this, what do my people think of treaty? What is their perception of treaty? And that took me on a journey. And, you know, for any student out there, for anybody that's doing research with their own communities, don't let academia say, oh, you're not objective. Because what I found out, you can live by the fisherwoman, the fisher person, the hunter, all your life, and really not know what they think about treaty until you ask them. And of course, my community put me through a lot to do that. I had to do a moose hunt. I had to do the, you know, I start out with fish and do the moose hunting and so forth. And I really wanted to know what they were thinking and some of our allies as well, way back then. And what came out of that was intergenerational and relational learning. There was great stories about calling on loved ones that had just passed on that were known hunters and fishers on, on our ancestors and so forth that you couldn't talk about treaty without talking about food. Food was number one priority and that uh, treaty is practiced, it's relational, and um, that it does have that uh, responsibility and that obligation that Elder Albert keeps reminding us and reminding us that with a right becomes responsibility. And my aunt who just passed away this past um, summer, she was like a matriarch that helped us learn that. And she would always make us clean up after our camps and so forth. And so these understandings was very um, relational with the responsibility to community and so forth with family, but also to the natural ecosystems that sustain those resources. And um, so that's what came out of my work. And, you know, and as that work came to an end, I remember, uh, Elder Pat, she told me, she said, Sherry, she said, do you realize how many young women are fishing and hunting? And I looked around and I said, yes, we have fisher women here. We have women that hunt and so forth, providing for their family with, yeah, and, and it was just, you know, remarkable. And that really got me to thinking and where I am in my current work. And a lot of times we forget about you know, gender. We forget about that. We all know that what the Indian Act did to us, it displaced actually women from our roles with the land. And we couldn't vote in our own band elections even until 1951. Think about that. We couldn't even vote in our own chief and council elections. And of course, we know all about losing status. And what was sad about all of this throughout the generations, you could start seeing this being internalized. And what I mean by that, where uh, our societies became very male dominant. And yet, despite all of that, trying to remove us from the land and from the waters and so forth, 
I noticed that there's there's men too, there's allies, but in a lot of situations here in Migamagi and Wolostuk and across Canada or Northern Turtle Island, women are sort of in the front, forefront of protecting their land and water from over exploitation or from damage and exploitation. And a lot of that we know is resource extraction, we know about the pipeline and so forth. And I wonder why that is, and I don't have an answer, but that's something maybe we can contemplate. And I was a little, I was starting to worry about the grandmothers and defenders at Alton Gas and that Sis and Mine, and wondering, you know, they were, they were arrested. Uh, they were intimidated and in every which way. And I've been working with them and have such high respect for them. And I, they're, they're not without their difficulties, but one of the things that became clear to me, this duty to consult is very limited. And it stops at the leadership. And that's not to take away from our leadership, but somehow there needs to be a mechanism. There needs to be a mechanism to reach out to the grassroots people. And that's, um, that's very concerning to me. And uh, I'm quite sure the lawyer wants to come out and PJ and so forth because there's so much corporate law and, you know, and I've been at some of these negotiation tables as an advisor or back in the day. And, you know, and you're told you can't talk about this because it involves, you know, a corporation and so forth. And so there's something to be said when we download the responsibility of negotiation or the duty to consult to corporations. And I just wanted to mention that. And so, you know, you look through the years and, and um, even with uh, the fracking issue, and this brings me to this upside down pyramid that should be the other way around. It seems to me in, uh, in Canada anyways, consultation, there's a duty to consult. That's top, then it comes down. Well, let's get consent. And that's very controversial how that happens. And it shouldn't be just through impact benefit agreements because it seems the government uses that, particularly in British Columbia. And then let's look at free prior and informed consent of the Universal Declaration on the Rights of People. And to me, I wrote elsewhere how, to me, treaty rights, Aboriginal rights, and you know, um, the International Declaration seems to be domesticated to Canadian law where it should be you know, free prior and informed consent for all peoples and particularly all the right holders, including the women, and then enter into consultation and then obtain you know, the broad consent of all right holders. And I think this is what's been so, what's so problematic today. And then I just wanna reference the um, um, truth and recon, not the, not the truth and reconciliation, the, um, final inquiry report that has been shelved because of COVID and yet all of these um, resource extraction projects going ahead. And there's all 231 recommendations and they're all great recommendations about services and stuff. But one thing that stood out to me was that we call upon all governments and in particular, and in particular indigenous governments and indigenous representative organizations to take urgent and special measures to ensure that indigenous women, girls and 2SLGBTQQIA people are represented in governance and that their political rights are respected and upheld. And another one was that gender-based socioeconomic impact assessments be conducted particularly in resource extraction. So I'm kind of concerned about where is the space for indigenous women and gender diverse persons. And I know that Kathy is probably under, cause she's created so many spaces for this to happen. We're involved in a number of other projects, but how do we create that space? And why is it that it's just one resource that we focus in on? And then perhaps that's because it started out with eels, but why is not protecting um, river systems, food systems, not a treaty right. Why do those women not have a right to do that? 
we must really ask that question. Why do they not have a right to do that? And, and we have to really kind of look at that. And why this is so important, I think, is that we have to look at how the Canadian government operates around the world outside of Canada and what it's doing to Indigenous people with resource extraction, particularly mining in other countries such as Guatemala, Philippines, and so forth. They're raping women, they're abusing women, and so forth. And so I'm trying to really steer my work in a way of how can we um, transform those structures that allow that to happen. And if that happens to our sisters in Guatemala, if that happens to our sisters in the Philippines, how can we as women here, indigenous women within our own country expect our rights and particularly our treaty rights to be upheld? And I know I'm sounding a little bit of pre preachy there, but I just wanted to, if anything, is that treaty rights is so broad and there's so many holders of those rights and I'll just end on this to support what um, our um, Vice Chief uh, PJ was saying about having to break the law. And it's very interesting if you look at that film that um, Kathy was showing you about Sikhanadukumut, <laughs> I'm still learning. Um, there is a beautiful piece in there where uh, former Chief Kerry Prosper and his grandson is, he's trying to explain to his grandson and he, you know, why we have to break the law in order to have indigenous law and treaty rights. The same is in defense of our treaties, another film by Martha Stegman. And you'll see former Chief Frank talk about that, how, you know, he said, we're really having to, you know, he said, we shouldn't have to, but we're teaching our children that they almost have to break the law in order to have our law, to have our treaties. And I just want to, you know, um, just build on what both of uh, these two gentlemen have uh, spoken about on what they've said to think that the treaty holder, the treaty rights holder, comes responsibility and it can't be just in these spheres of economic exploitation. And even when the environmental assessment says this is not healthy to do, we seem to have this language of mitigation. We seem to have this, uh, this uh, injunctions. We seem to have all of the law on the side of corporations to the disadvantage of the rights holders and particularly indigenous women. Wulalio, Mr. Nogama. Yeah, well, we, we reached the um, sections with Q&A. So um, I do not see any um, questions in the Q&A as yet. So maybe if um, somebody wants to expand on the conversation earlier, here's an opportunity to do so. From a layman's perspective. Yeah. The word that haunts me the most is sovereignty. Mm -hmm. In my simple understanding, there's only two ways people can achieve sovereignty. And that is either through surrender or through conquest. Since none of those took place here in the maritime, Is there, is there a, a, a room, a, a is there a way in which we can maneuver and actually question that concept of sovereignty and, 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 and uh, ask the Canadian government to prove beyond reasonable doubt that they are sovereign? And if not, uh, do we have a, 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 an, av an avenue in which we can take our case to the international arena since our treaties are pre-confederation? Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Um, Chief Prosper, you raised an important um, piece of information there, the, the conflict or the having to negotiate the, uh, the treaties with the um, federal government 
understanding of the treaties or interpretation. Do you think that that's the major issue that we are facing with non-Indigenous people, why we have all these conflicts that are happening around the fishing treaties and so on? You want to expand a little on that? Thank you for that. Um, I, I, I think that's the major component there. Um, it, it's when you have a recognition of a right and you have a, a decision that talks about that right, actually uh, defines that right, uh, at least in accordance to the law as exists uh, within Canada, there's an expectation that um, one can actually practice the right. And, and uh, you know, that there's a... Um, an honor on government, um, an expectation on government to implement the right. And, you know, and when you don't have that, um, like the Mi'kmaq don't have, a, we have constitutional rights as uh, recognized and affirmed in section 35, but uh, section 35, but we're one of the few people who have constitutional rights that doesn't have an attorney general to um, take suit against, um, you know, government on our behalf. So we're, we're forced, uh, you know, um, at the negotiation table and, um, you know, which can take an extended period of time. Uh, um, and, you know, you're you're essentially that. I mean, um, people want to practice the right. You know, people know what that right encompasses. And uh, w when you have uh, basically a response that says, well, you need to do it within this box, you know, and, and when they find out, well, the box is just like any under, other person is in the box, industry or you know uh non migma then the question becomes well what about you know what what the court said you know what about uh nature of the so uh, i i think that's a major component there uh that that is subject you know uh to the dispute that we're talking about thanks i will go to um elder dr albert marshall you have been fighting this fight for so many years and the younger people who are getting involved now, what advice would you give them about, you know, not getting frustrated or giving up and so forth? Speak to the young people who are listening on this program. Well, uh, the work has to expand. And that work, of course, has to entail you rely in using the institutions to help them to, to reawaken the spirit that's been dormant within them. Because once that spirit is reawakened, then, uh, you know, instead of reacting, they will always go on a proactive mode. And the, once that confidence is built, then I believe the attitude will change. That we will no longer see ourselves as 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 victims or as oppressed, but people that do have a right rightful place in which the Creator has put us put us upon us. But I believe, but I believe um, the, the institutions have that responsibility to help us validate to our young. Have make them youth that they have every right to be who they are, and they have every right to experience experience the, who they are, and 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 to live as it as it was intended for them to live, to to live, and to and to be a competent Mi'kmaq, rather than constantly trying to adapt and transform to something in which we will never be. It should become obvious to the, to the institutions that after many hundreds and hundreds of years, 
they have not managed to completely kill that spirit that's in us. That spirit is still alive. And for that spirit to be, to be completely reawakened, then the youth have to know wholeheartedly of who they are, where they come from, and why they are here. And that's going to that's going to depend on know to know to know who they are. They have to know it from their own language perspective, from their own language understanding, not not language that is completely foreign to them. So I believe this is where the institutions could have a a, a major responsibility to 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 help to help us help our young people to to validate of who they are so that they can feel competent, they, that they can feel that they can do anything that they want because they, they know for sure now they are, they are complete. But what's been missing now is that, that that spiritual component that's been missing in our lives so long that we, are, we feel we're somewhat incapacitated to a point, spiritually at least, and, and, and yet we're expected to excel but how can anyone excel if they are not if they are not complete? Because unless those four domains are maintained in a balanced and harmonious way, then I don't think anyone can excel in anything. To to academia, to sports, or to art, or to anything, because you feel you are not complete. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. I think we're having some technical difficulty because I'm seeing Chief Prosper is not here with us. But I want to ask Dr. Picto that you are here at Dalhousie. And if we get back, Chief Prosper, I'll pose the same question to him. I know Dalhousie is trying, but we are so far behind. What, what recommendations, what would you say to us? Tough question, I know, but you know. Um, this is speak truth to power. So this is your chance. Feel free to do so. Well, it's so strange that there was a University of the United States asked me the same thing. And um, this is such a big issue. And I think what had happened when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report came out, the calls to action, everybody wanted to do good. And you know, and it's so great that we do land acknowledgements and so forth, but it's got to go beyond that. And, um, you know, I, I read this critique here not too long ago about land acknowledgements that it kind of relegates Indigenous people to the past. It kind of, you know, and, and also particularly when in cities or urban centers, it kind of makes the Indigenous people disappear, but we're still here. And um, so I don't know, you know, how do we really tackle what is going on in the in, in the land and 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 so forth uh, beyond just recognizing it. And that's a big question. And I think uh, if everyone was listening to Dr. Albert, Elder Albert, there's a lot of uh, answers in Indigenous worldviews. And I think that, you know, I'm just recently at Dow. I did my PhD at Dow. Then I worked at Mount St. Vincent University for three years. And then I came to Dow. And one of the things I have noticed, but I do know their struggles, um, that they do have a minor program. They're looking to convert that into a major program in Indigenous studies, which I think is just uh, uh, a great. But one of the things that I have loved in my short time, and it's a weird time to be starting a new job during COVID, is the uh, amount of Indigenous presence in terms of my colleagues. And that really helps. And I think that um, with the help of Kathy, who's not here with her um, community engagement uh, portfolio and with the Indigenous Advisory Council and with Indigenous students and the elder and residents that if we can keep that together and keep communicating and opening up more spaces or indigenizing more spaces on campus that we have, um, we have, um, 
we have a we have a shot of bringing in that other world view as being just as legitimate as any other world view and if anything it should be more informative because it informs the human and non-human relationships and um that is that is my 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 hope there's something to be said to bring those disciplines together to bring those relationships together that's sort of like a long of the short a short answer but i'm hopeful and i think we're you know it's quite different compared to when i did my masters in the mid 1990s it's really different and the amount of indigenous scholarship is like whoa i wish i had that scholarship when i was doing my masters in the early 1990s uh, there's so mu much indigenous scholarship now thank you and um and I wonder if I, if I, if I may, Teresa. Cause please, yes, do. I, I do appreciate the, uh, the gestures that the institutions are making. But to me, they're very much superficial. Yes, it's nice, to, nice, nice for them to fly Mi'kmaq flag. Nice for them to put up a, a wigwam every once in a while. Now, the key word, in my humble opinion, is indigenization. Mm -hmm. And we're the only ones that can do the indigenization for, for them, not the institutions. Mm -hmm. Now, if the institutions are really serious, mm -hmm. and if they really commit themselves that they're going to be compelled, mm -hmm. then I think it's about time that we all sit down. We have people now like, like Mr. Prosper and, 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 and Ms. Pictor here that they can articulate our words for on our behalf to to uh, draft out a, an MOU mm -hmm. as to what journey we will need to, to travel on to accomplish this concept of indigenization. Without that MOU, then I think it's just going to be continuously lip service, which is something that it has not worked in the last couple hundred years. We want something more concrete, something more constructive. And the only thing that I can see at this juncture, of course, is, is some kind of a, a verbal commitment from the institution that they are willing to integrate our ways of knowing into the in, 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 into, in, into the learning of circle. Thank you. And I'm, and, and I'm not asking if that's possible. I think that's something that should be that should be asked. And if any institution refuses to, to go to that length, then I think it's about time we ignore that institution because that institution is not serious. We need, we need serious discussions now. We need serious commitment because right now our culture, our language is in a very low percentage. And if that, is, if that erodes further, then we will have that much more difficulty of articulating our, our ways of knowing the way it should be articulated. Because our language is so complete. Our language is quite different than the English language. In order for us to, ex to, to fully express of what we mean, it has to be done in a language. And we have people now that can help us. Here we have two people right here. We, on a ground level like myself, we, we can't, we, we, we're not there. But we don't have that educational background to be able to communicate that, to articulate that to, in, to, to, to a level in which it will be required, like in higher learning. So I think this is, this is the only way that I know. I'm sure it could be other ways, but that's the only way I know that, that could really cement the kind of a relationship that needs to exist between the institution and the original people of this land. Dr. Marshall, thanks very much for that. And this is a reminder that this forum is being recorded so that when we are ready, we will play back exactly what you just said. Part of the mandate of the Director for Indigenous Community Engagement, Catherine, she's back, is to form an advisory council or board with the community. So my question, which is building on what Dr. Marshall said, and um, Chief Prosper, you 
as a former graduate of Dalhousie, you know the inside and you know the outside. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the role of the community has to play in, in, in manifesting some of the things that Dr. Marshall just said? How do we get this MOU? Who could, how could we indigenize the university, which is what he's proposing? Thank you for that. Um, I, I really like that um, concept that uh, Albert mm -hmm. I mentioned about indigenization and I, I guess, you know, where the discussion should begin rightfully is at the very top. I mean, you know, there, there has to be um, concerted effort amongst uh, within the institution of the university to, to broker, you know, um, you know, uh, a meeting to firm, you know, you know, get uh, a proper understanding on what, you know, um, that particular uh, topic means, not only from a um, academic level, but also from um, a Mi'kmaq community level. Um, there has to be that integration you know, of uh, that's grounded within the reality of the day to day um, at a, a nationhood perspective and a community perspective, a Mi'kmaq community perspective. And, you know, there has to be that openness. Um, there, there has to be that trust and willingness to um, and commitment to um, allow that to happen. You know, I, I, I think that would be um, at least a, a fairly good step forward. Thank you for that. Now we could we could continue with that conversation because the university, one of the co-sponsors for this forum tonight is the Indigenous Advisory Council and also the um, Dalhousie Faculty Association. So there are several people who are working towards this realization. Um, but I think from this forum, we are getting a lot more serious recommendations um, that, you know, that while we are working on the inside and having this conversation, it requires much more action. And this is what uh, Dr. Marshall is suggesting. So um, I'm going to leave it open if Dr. Pictou or Dr. Marshall, we are almost coming to the end, but I don't want to be the voice here. I want you all to express your, your, um, perspectives. And as I said, we will carry this through from senior leadership all the way down, you know, with the help of the uh, Indigenous community on the campus. So, um, Dr. Marshall, please go ahead. Now, um, you know, bearing in mind mm -hmm. that our form of communications are quite different. Mm -hmm. Our communications are up to, up to now, up to now has been very much oral. Whereas in the institutions, everything is in the written text. Yeah. Now we have no problem whatsoever of weaving back and forth between these two methodologies. Because as I said, I'm very, I'm very comfortable in saying there are people like Mr. Prosper and Ms. Ms., 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 Ms. Victor there to help us articulate what we are saying so that it will be truly reflective then of what 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 the Mi'kmaq what the what the Mi'kmaq people are really saying. So I don't see any problem. And and if it's not committed into text, then it's just a hearsay. Nobody's nobody's going to be bound by that. But if it's committed to text, I believe that would be a that would be our our roadmap as to how we move forward together in a co-learning spirit. And I think that this is something that the um, Indigenous Community Advisory Board or whatever we end up calling it, that would be one of the major mandates. So thank you for that suggestion. We will definitely put it on that um, trajectory. Uh, Dr. Pictou, I saw that you were reaching to unmute your phone. Did you want to add something to that? No, but I do see where Kathy is available on the cell phone now. Yeah, I was trying to get her. Kathy, yeah. are you yeah. there? 
I'm on a cell phone. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, please go okay. ahead. You have, so uh, I have been listening off and on. It's just, uh, and I came in the city so I'd have great internet because I live in the country and uh, the government hasn't given us high speed yet. Uh, um, so I'm in the city, but it's still knocked out for some reason. Um, but I've been listening and I'm, as the director of Indigenous Community Engagement, you've given me so many more ideas and some more work to do. And I really hope that you're going to come on board and just keep us guided and keep moving us. I mean, the ideas you have and, and the knowledge and the experience, you know, is invaluable. And we need we need everybody to come together to to move forward, as as uh, PJ said. And um, I just love looking at our community and our relative. Like Carrie Prosper always says, you know, the salmon are our relatives. We're all connected. We give each other our lives so that we others can live. And without that food chain. Without those important parts of the food chain, we're unbalanced and we're in trouble. And we see it here with COVID. We see what can happen and what will be if we don't consider seven generations ahead of us. So I, I don't know if I'm cutting in or cutting out, but I apologize for whatever is going on with the internet here. But I'm just so grateful for your knowledge. And thank goodness it's recorded so I can catch whatever I didn't. I just wondered if, as we're closing, or am I? Did someone else have something to say? But as we're closing, um, we always ask our Mi'kmaq elders to welcome us to this territory, and we ask them to open with a prayer um, to ask those who've gone before us to come and help us to do what we need to do. So I would like to ask if, again, once they open, they also have to close that's their responsibility and i'd love to hear from albert to close if we're ready to go um i can't see you so i don't know okay well before we call um elder albert oh, yeah. the closing yeah. i'd just like to officially thank all the panelists it was indeed an honor and a privilege to have you on this forum i know you all are very busy and important people and um you know, we are very honored that you took the time to come and speak to us and speak to everybody who's listening here. So my sincerest thanks. And I want to thank Kathy because without her, we probably wouldn't know how to reach you. Or even if we did reach you, whether you would agree to come and speak with us. I want to thank Kathy for making that connection and for helping co-host the uh, event. I want to thank our um, co-sponsors, the Indigenous Advisory Council and Dalhousie Faculty Association. And my team, my, my um, Speak Truth to Power Forum team. So I want to thank you. You're behind the scenes, but you make it happen through difficult situations as well. And to the audience for being here and participating. And um, there was a lot of positive um, compliments coming in the Q&A. So please note that your contribution was highly valued and it's recorded and we will use it. Um, that's it, uh, Dr. Albert Marshall was talking about the importance of writing stuff, but in today's world, we also have the recorded stuff. So we will be able to replay some of the things that you told us that we need to do and honor those things, Dr. Marshall. So. Thank you again for being here, and I will now hand it over to you to do the closing. And before I close, though, I would also like to request that I, I think we do acknowledge that the issues that we are sharing with you, with the institution, could be seen somewhat be very complex. But I would hope that uh, at, each, at each session it's been concluding someone should be prepared to uh, write down uh, at least what actions can we can we pursue and what would be the main main issues that we can that we can that we can prioritize as an action items 
for the for, for the next because without these action items, I don't believe uh, we will ever reach to the point where someone has to be held responsible of uh, acting or, or responding to some of the, some of the key points that that can and should be uh, implemented or, or put in place at this point in time. So. This is the this is my last request that at least someone should be able to prioritize some of the issues that that that, that has been exchanged tonight and and transform those as an action action items for the next session if there's going to be one. Thank you. With that, I, with that, I will just say acknowledge that. Uh, good, you know, how you know? I'm Tante tu vuoi dire, a te tu vuoi dire, a te tu vuoi dire, a te tu vuoi dire, con la manella mia anago, chi si muove qui da noi, scusa, 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 Thank you very much. Well, thank you.